good day to all great to be with you today on behalf of our institute i would like to welcome you to our today's webinar today we have with us yokam branchma from netstal fuel cell technology who will be discussing with us on the topic true zero decarbonized shipping with hydrogen fuel cell propelled vessels a few words about our speaker yokam branchma is head of maritime applications at netstal and he, Yokum holds a master's degree in control systems engineering and a bachelor's in industrial automation from Han University of Applied Science. He is co-author of articles on the application of fuel cells and driving cycle catalyzation. Yokum has worked in several of senior engineering and management positions at Boscalis and Hansman E-Tech Experts, where he was involved in many innovative and challenging projects. He is a board member of Sistas and actively involved in the Hydrogen Europe Maritime Work Group and the IEA HIA Task 39 Expert Group. His first experience with maritime fuel applications date back to the development of the Nemo H2, a fuel cell-driven round-trip boat for Alvinis Marine Technology. Let's welcome Yokum Branchma to deliver the presentation. Over to you. The floor is yours, Yokum. Thank you, Biju. Share my screen straight away. So we can uh, give it a go. Thank you very much for this invitation to uh, uh, provide you this um, sort of a, a guest lecture on PEM fuel cell technology. I'm very happy to um, be here and um, explain to you how fuel cells um, can help the shipping industry decarbonize um, and also to show you that this technology is already there and we can start decarbonizing actually today. Um, as Bijou already explained, I'm um, application manager maritime systems, and I'm responsible for all the maritime um, projects uh, and inquiries that we are doing at the NetStack and that we receive. Um, and my background is indeed, uh, for instance, uh, for over eight years with Boscalis. Um, and so I have a background in the shipping industry, and what we try to do at NetStack is work together with that industry to find solutions and deliver solutions to decarbonize. Today, I want to run you through um, a couple of different items. Look at that a little bit. Um, I'll explain briefly about our company, then about the capabilities and the technology that we are providing and how this technology is then um, put into different solutions and which markets that we are targeting. Um, and then in specific, of course, the maritime applications, and we'll um, have a short stop at hydrogen safety and some uh, projects that are on the way. But before we go there, um, first thing is, um, I wanna show you a little bit of a, a picture that we borrowed from the uh, Department of Energy from the United States about the hydrogen economy. Uh, there's a lot going on at the moment. Hydrogen has been um, shooting to the stars um, in the last two to three years. Um, and we see that there is a large potential and interest, of course, in decarbonizing our industries, um, our mobility, uh, even also our um, built environment. And at the other side, we see this strong rise of renewable energy which unfortunately is not always there. So we need to store that renewable energy. Um, we can do that in batteries for more short-term application, but if we're looking at longer-term application, longer-term storage, um, like seasonal storage, uh, um, hydrogen could be a, way, a, a very feasible way forward because the only thing you need is electricity and water and you can produce hydrogen. We are right in the middle turning hydrogen back into electricity, um, supplying to a electric grid, or of course, to a maybe um, mobile grid like on board of a ship. Some words on NetStack. Um, we've been in the fuel cell business for over 20 years. We started out as a research department of Axo Nobel, a big chemical company who had chlorine factories where they were producing hydrogen. And at the same time, they were providing um, different materials um, to the fuel cell business. 
And they said, we would like to use those fuel cells to turn that hydrogen that we have as a byproduct, and which we're flaring off at the moment. We like to use that um, to provide clean energy. However, the solutions that uh, were in the market at that time, um, mostly focusing on very low power, high volumes, were not deemed feasible um, to be on a chemical plant. And that's where NetStack started to develop industrial fuel cell stacks. And that's what we've been doing as an independent company for over 20 years now, looking after that industrial part of the market. Just a glance of our timeline. Um, we started in 1997, um, but already two years after that, we became a independent company, privately owned. Um, we produced our second generation of fuel cell stacks. And we started with those in 2005 and the first power plant in the world went live in 2007. So that's over a decade ago. In 2011, we built the first megawatt power plant, and I'll show you later some uh, a picture of this plant. And in 2016, we've built the largest fuel cell power plant in the world, and also our first um, power plant went already through the decade of operational time. So when you look at fuel cell technology and what we do in that business. Um, we aim to have all the capabilities, all the knowledge from powder to power. So we have our fuel cell um, development office where we can do really R&D, basic information. We have different laboratory setups to do all kinds of verifications and uh, verify new materials, verify different type of um, operational conditions. We have manufacturing of the fuel cell stacks in-house as well as application centers to put those fuel cells into a use, into a certain sector or an application, and also return information from the application back to the development. And this is then what we literally call from powder to power. We start with uh, what we call as a bulk molding compound. So we have four basic materials that are mixed together. And from that um, mix, that compound, we create bipolar plates. Those bipolar plates are the cell plates are the basis of a fuel cell. Um, and they combine into a fuel cell stack. And I'll go into that um, in just a minute. On top of that, we have a cell voltage monitoring system, like a comparable to a battery management system, which is monitoring each individual fuel cell and telling us how it's performed. Those cells, that CVM is then combined in the fuel cell stack, and those stacks are our cassette type electrochemical reactors, which are then installed in power plants. And to build those power plants, we work together with what we call code makers. We find select companies, um, local, um, it could also be international system integrators from a certain sector that bring in the knowledge that um, in a sector is, is available and is also applicable. So for instance, an industrial fuel cell site that's gonna be on a chemical plant and we work with system integrators that are from that area. If we want to put vessel, fuel cells on board of a um, sea going or an inland ship, we try to select um, suppliers that are working in that area because the rules, the regulations of a certain sector are different, have their own characteristics. And it's good to work and combine the best of two worlds um, into our power plants. And then we have the software to control everything. That's enough about, um, about what we can do. Let's dig into the technology. What we are producing is low temperature PEM fuel cells. And this low temperature PEM fuel cell is one out of many different fuel cell types. And the fuel cells is also a sort of collection of different electrochemical reactors. You might also have heard of the alkaline fuel cells, maybe not as a fuel cell, but as an electrolyzer, which is also using membrane technology. And the same yields for PEM fuel cells, and you also have PEM electrolyzers using similar materials, similar technology to create hydrogen, where we take that hydrogen and turn it back into electricity. There's direct methanol fuel cells, 
um, that are um, sometimes used, for instance, on a campsite uh, to provide a little bit of electric power. Um, molten carbonate fuel cells is something that is um, out there as well as the solid oxide fuel cells. And as you can see, the fuel that is available or that can be used in those fuel cells could also be, for instance, natural gas or methanol. And this opens, of course, opportunities. However, the downside is, is that you still have emissions and you're working at a relatively high temperature, um, which also means that you need a lot of time to start up those fuel cells. And one of the downsides is that they cannot handle very dynamic loads. Right? You have to think about minutes to go from one load to another. However, for base load type of applications, um, this could be a feasible solution. The PEM fuel cells that we are supplying um, are all the way in the top, uh, and we operate around 60 to 65 degrees. At that temperature, you don't have any other um, reactions other than the fuel, uh, in this case, the hydrogen uh, reacts with the oxygen, which means that there are also no other emissions because the air that goes in um, also goes out again. So how does this fuel cell then work? In the fuel cell, you have a membrane, which is a proton exchange membrane. And the name says everything. It allows protons from the hydrogen to travel through that membrane while the electrons are not. So the membrane itself is electrically isolating. The cell plates are electrically um, conductive. And so they can give a current and they can conduct a current through those cell plates, go through a certain load, and then um, we close that electrical circuit at the other side of the membrane where oxygen is taken from air and that oxygen splits and reacts with the uh, hydrogen protons and the hydrogen electrons um, and turn into pure water. And this chemical reaction happens because of a catalyst, which is there. And in our case, at the moment is platinum. And we, as many other uh, companies, are now also researching other catalysts to um, reduce the need for, for platinum. So one fuel cell then holds, so it consists of two cell plates, um, some sealants, electrolytes, and this together forms one fuel cell. At the back of each fuel cell, we have um, cooling channels, um, which make sure that the heat that is generated in this exothermic chemical reaction between hydrogen and oxygen is removed um, as efficient as possible. And then one fuel cell can do up to 250 amps in our case, um, on the normal conditions, but it does it at somewhere between zero and one volts. So if you're running at peak load, you might go down to half a volt per cell, which for one cell doesn't really make sense. Eh? You don't have any power from that. But by the stacking those fuel cells, hence the name net stack, you create a much larger uh, potential difference. Um, and we stack up to 96 cells in our current generation of stacks. So one stack can provide up to 200 amps, 250 amps, and with a maximum voltage of 100 volts. Um, so this package of cells, um, you see the black box in the middle, um, they are packed together, they are compressed a little bit to make sure that all the seals are um, duly pressed together and that they are leak tight. We connect a cell voltage monitoring system to check on all of the um, cells and the performance. And then we have a quick connection assembly to make sure that we can easily exchange a uh, fuel cell stack when it's either end of life or requires some kind of service because of an internal error or failure. Um, and we make sure that you can replace it easily. So we have these in different sizes. Um, we have a small one, a seven kilowatt, a medium size, 10 kilowatt fuel cell stack and, an, and a 13 kilowatt stack. And this 13 kilowatt is what we generally use in our own systems. So if you look at such a stack, um, I won't go through all of the details, um, but you see that you have a varying voltage. 
and you can get, get up to 13.3, 13.5 um, kilowatts, and such a stack is around 40 kilograms. And it has the size of a big shoe box. It's about 600 millimeters long. It's about 200 uh, millimeters wide and 300 high. So if you look at the um, voltage curve of such a fuel cell stack, which we call a polarization curve, you can see that the voltage of a fuel cell stack is depending on the current. And where we start at maybe 96 volts, then you end at 60 volts. And even when you get uh, towards end of life, it goes even lower towards 50 volts. Um, so the voltage is other than with the battery it's really depending on the current so the more current you draw the lower the voltage gets and this is a partly to do because of the um, ohmic losses that are there in the fuel cell stack um, some activation losses and these ohmic losses um, they prevent the voltage to be stable so when you can reduce the ohmic losses um, you get more cell voltage and in the end also more efficiency. I already mentioned it, uh, there is a difference be between beginning of life and end of life. So this is a figure of the efficiency of a fuel cell uh, system where you can see at the left side that beginning of life you have a um, electrical efficiency at 30% load. So this graph starts at 30% of over 57% efficiency from an electric point of view. When it's new, even at a 100% um, output power um, from a system, you're still above 50% efficiency. Then of course you have thermal energy that you could use and there's some energy wasted in the auxiliaries that we are using and some radiation of heat to air. But most of the um, heat is also can be recovered um, if you have good use for that. And you can imagine that this heat could be used to warm up the accumulation of a vessel or heat houses, um, apartment buildings. When you look at the graph on the right side, you see that this is the end of life efficiency diagram. There you see that at 30%, the efficiency has already uh, dropped a bit, but it's still about uh, above 50%. And up to, I would say, approximately 75%, you're still operating in an efficiency of 50%. Well, if you then go to maximum power, that the efficiency is dropping towards 45 percent and this is what we call end of life the stack deteriorates through different um, sources different uh, reasons why a stack uh, becomes older um, and this has an effect of efficiency and that efficiency is directly related to the voltage and you can see in this picture um, that uh, we measured this um, uh, voltage over a, a very long time at a certain operating point uh, where our plant is designed for 15 years and the stack lifetime is about 24,000 hours. And here you can see that that voltage is slowly dropping. And that means that if you have a lower voltage, you need more current to provide the same amount of power as in the beginning. And because you need more power, the voltage even drops a bit further. And that's why you will see that the efficiency really decreases towards the end. So the degradation of a fuel cell stack um, is partly reversible. Uh, partly of, that, uh, of the degradation is um, during operation. During operation, some kind of contaminants um, uh, can go into the fuel cell that that that, that remain there. Um, also, um, you get a little bit of laziness, a little bit of oxidation of the catalyst in the fuel cell stack, making it perform a little bit less. However, if you do a start-stop uh, cycle and you switch the fuel cell off and you start it up again, um, we have a sort of a cleaning process which means that it will perform um, better again. That's the reversible part. Then you have some irreversible decay 
contaminants in the um, hydrogen, in the oxygen, um, maybe high concentrations of CO2 or CO, um, but could also be uh, what we've seen on the chemical plant that you have maybe some ammonia in the air at some point. This will um, cause irreversible decay. In addition, you have material aging. Um, the, the seals that we are using, uh, they are um, sort of stressed. They have, uh, are operating at a certain temperature, maybe cooling down again, and they age over time. They're in contact with demi water. So um, the material ages, and for instance, the seals become um, less sealing um, at some point which is also causing the efficiency to drain because some of the hydrogen, which you will actually want to use in the fuel cell, goes out through those seals. Um, hydrogen impurities, as discussed, same air contamination, maybe some cooling water uh, contamination for some reason could cause uh, stack degradation because you have some hotspots um, because there's some um, materials in there um, as well as the oxidation. And then you have some really uh, decremental um, events, uh, fuel starvation. If you are drawing current and you take away the hydrogen while you're still operating, um, you will have this electrochemical reaction start to react something else. In our case, that would be the carbon, that would be the cell, cell plates themselves instead of the hydrogen. And this causes, um, of course, irreversible uh, damage. Cooling failure. If the stack would overheat, um, uh, you have uh, an issue. Um, it's not by definition unsafe, but the performance drops uh, um, immediately. You can have this as well as, of course, an, uh, an overpressure, things like this. So these things can influence the lifetime of the stack. However, in our case, we have designed a stack that can be refurbished. Um, so after 24,000 hours, if everything just went well, we can take the stack out of the system, bring it back to our workshop, we take it apart, we put new membranes in, the old membranes go to a recycling company who can take uh, back around, I think, 95% of all the platinum. So actually a very little amount of platinum is lost um, to bring that back into new membranes. Uh, we can reassemble the fuel cell stack and put it back in operation. And we um, have seen that we can do that at least two times before also the cell plates have become at a certain age. But at that time, you're already at 80,000 hours. Uh, you might have well uh, uh, reached 15 years of operation before the fuel cell stack is also um, finally end of life. So this fuel cell stack um, is just a static electrochemical reactor. It doesn't do anything as long as you don't put in any hydrogen, any air or cooling water. So to do this, uh, we have to look at fuel cell systems. Um, this is a system around the stack, which provides that air in the right condition, which provides the hydrogen in the right condition and also provides the cooling water. Um, to start with the air, um, we just take in normal air. This gets uh, filtrated um, uh, at a uh, high level of uh, particle um, filters. And because of our air channels in the fuel cell stacks, they are quite um, small. So any particles in air that should be filtered out, but that's well possible with commercial um, uh, filtering um, that we can just buy. Then we have an air blower and we blow that air through a humidifier. A fuel cell stack operates best if it's nice and humid. Um, it helps the protons to go through the membranes and it helps the overall electrochemical reaction. So we humidify the air. Normally we do that with the outgoing air and because this fuel cell stack is producing water as a result. So the air coming out of the fuel cell is very humid, is very, there's a lot of water um, vapor in there. And part of that vapor is used to heat up and also humidify um, the air going into the fuel cell stack. The hydrogen um, can come from any type of hydrogen storage as long as it's hydrogen. And we operate our stacks at only 250 millibar. So it's at a very low pressure. 
Um, normally we would have uh, some kind of a simple pressure reduction going into the fuel cell stacks and then the hydrogen is recirculated. Um, and this is something that you can compare with fuel recirculation and on an uh, internal combustion engine um, where we also, uh, by recirculation, um, also heat up the um, hydrogen as well as the hydrogen also gets humidified um, for an um, ideal reaction. In that hydrogen, there could be some contaminants. Uh, we can work with something like 99.5% pure hydrogen, which means that there's still half a percent of something else in that hydrogen. The hydrogen, um, by recirculating, you're building up that something else, uh, which could be maybe nitrogen, which is not that bad. <coughs> Apologies. And you can, uh, uh, but there could be something else as well. However, if you are just recirculating nitrogen all the time, at some point you are getting an inert type of mixture, of course, and that's not really good for performance. So in general, you also have to purge every now and then or constantly a very little amount of hydrogen to make sure that you don't get a buildup of um, impurity uh, into the fuel cell and uh, into the fuel um, lines. As said, we call on stack level. Um, we integrate the cooling water system to make everything a sort of a closed loop and we can deliver this heat to an external system and it could be a dry air cooler, but it could well be a, uh, um, a seawater cooling system or a heat recovery system. <coughs> um, the power output as we've seen is um, depending on current and uh, so the voltage is depending on the current uh, which means that if you want to feed into a stable grid you will always need some kind of power electronics um, these power electronics could be <coughs> either dc dc or dc ac and we don't normally don't uh, integrate that into our system because it's often to the client's choice what he wants to feed and um, I'll have some slides showing a few of those integrations. Um, the fuel cell system itself also needs some kind of um, utility power to start up the air blower, to start up the cooling water pump. So we cannot operate um, without any external power. So how does the system look like? This is our 100 kilowatt industrial fuel cell system. In this system, you see the fuel cell stacks on the right. You see the air blower just behind that. Um, there's some manifolding. There's a lot of stainless steel piping for the cooling water, for the air, and for the hydrogen to make sure that everything goes um, in the right direction. And also the um, electronics, yeah, the control um, there is for um, is included. The principle of our system is that you have a basic building block that you can either use um, in, uh, in a 100 kilowatt system, in a 20 kilowatt system, in, um, uh, uh, but also in a 500 kilowatt system. And you just add more um, 13 uh, kilowatt fuel cell stacks. And what you see here is a larger version of that 100 kilowatt plant. This is a 500 kilowatt plant um, and where we um, define this. Uh, eh? And if you do a quick math, you think, okay, 60 times 13, that's much more than 500 kilowatt. That's correct. Uh, we operate fuel cell stacks not to their maximum peak power. So we operate to a maximum of around 11 and a half, 12 kilowatts. Um, and we also compensate already for the internal losses that we might have. So that if you're a ship owner and you're buying this fuel cell system, even at the end of the lifetime, you still have 500 kilowatt available to grid. Oh, this one. So where do you see those fuel cell systems used? In our case, eh? industrial applications or what we call high power 
high use applications, which is the maritime and ports, which is build environment, which is the industry. Think about applications where your fuel cell system, where your power generation demand is 24 seven, 365 days a year. This is where we design fuel cells. Um, I'll show you very briefly um, of um, our achievements, just to show you that this is not just a concept, but it's really out there. So this was the uh, PEM fuel cell power plant, um, the first one in the world. It's only 75 kilowatts, but it's been operating until today. And I think um, uh, until last year, I must say, and we're now thinking about maybe refurbishing this unit and then give it the second life. But it's already been in operation for more than 10 years without major maintenance requirements because you don't have any moving articles. Um, we did already 10 years ago a um, demonstration with a small uh, beaver dredger out in the, uh, uh, Lake Grevelingen. And uh, not, late, not much after that, we also built the first megawatt fuel cell power plant. Um, so it shows that this technology, um, while not being very known, has been around for quite a while. Like you already mentioned, um, one of my first projects uh, uh, when leaving college was this fuel cell boat in the Amsterdam canals. It's been, it has been sailing for about three months, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but in the end, the project, um, uh, yeah, uh, didn't go through because of the lack of hydrogen supply. So the refueling station that was intended um, didn't uh, end up where it should be. And then, um, yeah, no hydrogen, no fuel cells. Um, that ended the story of this boat. As mentioned, we also built the largest fuel cell power plant in the world. It's about two megawatt output power. Um, but it's operating at an efficiency of around 60%, which means that there is over 3.5 megawatt fuel cell stacks installed in this power plant. So it's just to show you that even this is maybe stationary, um, high power applications have already been um, demonstrated in the past, uh, which also gives us credibility to also move the systems towards um, the maritime industry. And to do this, we work together with uh, um, uh, a lot of companies, like in this, the Felmar project that we did, which we call the next generation of fuel cell systems, where we built a demonstration unit of only 40 kilowatts. Uh, and we did a project about integration together with Marin, with Damen, um, and for instance, Future Proof Shipping. And as you saw in the little movie on the left, on the right hand corner, and we also put this system to the test and see what happens if you put the fuel cell system in sort of sea motion um, simulation, making angles of 22 degrees in all directions. And we learned from that that the fuel cell stack is actually, and the fuel cell system is actually working quite well. If you look at how such a system would then be integrated into any application, the fuel cell system is actually only replacing a the power generator. So in this case, um, yeah, we have a, a, a ship as an example. You have the fuel cell in the middle with the stacks um, as the center and also the part that we produce ourselves. But then you need the hydrogen delivery, the storage, um, the refueling, the bunkering is still required. And of course, it requires a lot of attention. And at the other side, you have the power management, the power conversion, propulsion system, uh, secondary en energy systems, like for instance, batteries, super caps. And we try to work together with those um, systems, know the companies that are working on this and find um, the right integration um, to do this and create feasible um, and easy to grasp solution. So you've seen our systems in the presentation. So what we call these are our portfolio products, um, but they are configured to order. Um, for instance, the 500 kilowatt, if you don't want that as a container, but you want to integrate that, for instance, in an engine room, that's possible. It doesn't change the PNID, it doesn't change the design, doesn't change the components, um, but we can integrate this into a vessel, um, for instance. And that brings us to the maritime application. What happens if you want to install these fuel cell systems into um, inland and seagoing vessels? 
the first question is why should you um and this i know this is a very um very brief and direct uh, uh picture um there's of course multiple um shades of gray here um but if you look at um zero emission shipping uh, you probably would look for battery um, ships first. And if you can do it with batteries, I think there's no need to look into fuel cells. However, with batteries, of course, you have a sort of limited range. You have long charging times. And the power density in the end, if especially for a high, uh, even with large systems, is not that high and you're quite weather sensitive. However, your zero emission, you're efficient. You have, of course, all of the uh, um, advantages of electric propulsion. It's quiet and you can locally source that uh, um, energy. And, you can, um, and it's quite efficient. So on the other side, if you, uh, where do batteries uh, come in um, and where you have problems? Of course, the range uh, with the battery, you can only go that far. And with hydrogen, um, the energy is stored in the hydrogen. So um, it's mostly depending on the amount of hydrogen that you can take, which is in general much bigger than the amount of, uh, of batteries that you can install. Um, you can, as with fuel, uh, you can relatively fast bunker, um, maybe not as fast as uh, uh, you do now, however, much faster than charging, and you have a low weather sensitivity because the performance of the fuel cell is not determined by the, um, the outside temperature. However, um, things are getting complicated because there are no rules. Um, regulations, rules are in progress. However, they're not there yet. Um, IMO has made their amendments, um, a proposal, um, which is not sort of approved. I think they are now in um, one out of many um, iterations. And that's just on fuel cells. So it doesn't say anything on hydrogen. Mostly it's by, based on the IGF code, uh, which is of course already there for quite a while, but the IGF code does not allow fuel cells. Um, and it's mainly based on, on LNG and internal combustion. So we have now the amendment for fuel cells, it's in process for hydrogen, there still needs to be something there. However, the IGF code opens up a, a possibility, which is called the alternative risk-based design method. And this is the way forward with hydrogen and fuel cell projects, is that you prove um, that your system through hazards, through um, involving classification very early on in your process, that your system is as safe as um, current systems um, like internal combustion engines. So the fuel cell can be um, provided with, it needs to be provided with hydrogen, but that hydrogen can come from any carrier. Uh, most obvious would be compressed hydrogen or liquefied hydrogen, cryogenic hydrogen. Uh, and of course, we will all want to be that uh, to be green, so it can come from renewables. However, storage of hydrogen on board is a big issue. Um, it takes a lot of space. So there's a lot of research going on to all kinds of other hydrogen carriers and also, of course, different e-fuels, um, which can use, be used as a hydrogen carrier. But that would include some reforming, cleaning before you can use it in the fuel cell. And then the fuel cell can, use, can be used to uh, uh, feed into an electrical grid or to a heat grid, um, as would be for an internal, internal combustion engine. Um, hopefully this is a little bit uh, is visible um, and it's just to indicate that the fuel cell system can be used in many different um, applications. Um, it could be DC, it could be AC, it could be low power, it could be high power uh, uh, DC. Um, it can be um, just battery um, hybrid. Um, it could also well be um, hybrid with internal combustion engines. Um, uh, as we said, or um, if you look at back in history, the Romans, they um, also kept their rowers on board when they started experimenting with sails and the first steam vessel still had sails on board. So starting with hybrid solutions, 
um, sounds to me as a very um, feasible solution. However, it's not required. And you can do it fully zero emissions straight away. You see an example of a, a DP2 vessel uh, with an AC grid where you have one um, conventional uh, generator room and one zero emission um, generator room with fuel cells. Could also be a um, DC grid, for instance, um, um, in a hybrid uh, uh, a solution where, for instance, the main generator would be used as a backup or when you don't have any hydrogen available in the next few years, which is um, reasonable to assume that you might have issues every now and then or at some parts of the world and your conventional uh, diesel engines would then be um, used as backup. And of course, if you're operating in an area, um, think about maybe a wind farm uh, in the near future where you have hydrogen available and you could also go fully zero emission um, on a DC grid to uh, have uh, the highest um, efficiency, for instance, uh, with the conversion technology. It's all possible. Um, we can play around with the solutions and find the right way. The control system itself, um, think about it like a diesel engine. Um, everything is included. You just send start, stop, um, and you get signals out of it. And um, that's it. It operates fully automatic. And it communicates with the power management system as well as with the energy management system. And there, are, for instance, for the power management system, it's like, just like any other generator with different characteristics. Looking at the gas interface, one of the um, most of the projects that we see at the moment are looking at compressed hydrogen, um, where you have a pressure reducer close to the hydrogen storage, and then have double wall piping into your vessel. And we go to the very low pressure um, and into the stacks. And those systems then can be into uh, just integrated in your engine room and becoming a fuel cell room. Liquid hydrogen, a low pressure, um, could be a, a very interesting alternative because you have a much higher power density than, for instance, compressed. But of course, we lack the interface still, um, but it's something that we need to develop over the course of the next few years. And for instance, for inland shipping, I would like to just show you this briefly. And one of the concepts that we're that companies are thinking about is a modular energy concept that you can do it with batteries at some point and at, um, at for a certain job. And then you need more than that. And you can replace those battery containers by fuel cell containers, integrate them, have a standardized DC grid. And maybe even at some point when you need to go really far, you could replace the um, containers for hydrogen by a diesel engine and, and diesel fuel. Um, while reducing most of your operation, all of your emissions. If you look at today's availability of hydrogen, uh, um, just to give you a brief um, overview of um, the different applications um, and, and, and the possibilities, um, you can start with a simple bundle, uh, but it's only 200 kilowatt hours. So um, if you have a 100 kilowatt system, um, you blast through this uh, within two hours. This is, of course, not the most ideal. However, if you, for instance, go to 20-foot um, um, containers at 500 bar, you already bring 9 megawatt hour with you. If you compare that to the usable energy, for instance, for a um, battery container, hey, you're around 1.5 megawatt hour. So there you see the difference between the power density of hydrogen versus the um, batteries. Of course, you need a fuel cell system next to that to turn that hydrogen into electricity. And if you go to liquid hydrogen, in general, the um, uh, amount of or the, the, the power density rises. So the energy density rises with about two and a half to a factor three. Some words on safety. Um, hydrogen is very, very different than anything else that we are using at the moment. Yeah, it's 14 times lighter than air. It's really, really cold um, if you want to liquefy it. Um, yeah, it's one, almost 100 degrees Celsius colder than uh, LNG. The outer ignition temperature, on the other hand, is much higher than, for instance, of diesel. And the energy density 
um, for a kilogram is also quite high, but of course to have a kilogram of hydrogen um, requires a lot of space. The explosion limits have a, quite a wide range, it's four to 75 percent, <coughs> while diesel ranges from 0 0.6 to seven and a half. So there you see that it requires a lot of caution. So think about um, collision, about fire, purging, people um, not knowing what is happening. And these are all the things that you have to think about when installing fuel cells and hydrogen on board. It's new, crew needs to be retrained, um, uh, uh, but you have to think about all of the other things that could go wrong when, the crew, uh, when using hydrogen. So there's a, <coughs> apologies, a, a couple of um, different safety concepts that are now in um, regulations, which would be a diluted concept there, where you ventilate the amount, uh, uh, if there's hydrogen leakage, you just make sure that it's diluted, that it doesn't reach the 4%. Um, you could also make everything explosion safe or inerting the space. So this is a concept and then by doing a lot of risk assessments, um, you can prove that you have everything in control, that you have the different risks assessed and mitigated. So finally, I would like to show you a couple of uh, projects that we've been doing just to give you an idea what, what is possible. Uh, here you see a, a tugboat, which we designed with OSD, IMT. Um, and we looked from <coughs> a perspective where we said, what can we do with um, uh, fuel cells on board of a tugboat? And, and, and can this tugboat then do what it's supposed to? And we see that it is indeed possible. Um, however, your range is much shorter and you might be able to, you might need to refuel every day, but it's not really a problem because that tugboat is in port most of the day anyway. And your work is very well planable. The same is for an offshore supplier we developed with Ulstein, uh, where you have, for instance, in a wind farm, it can do all of the work on DP2, zero emission, um, because it's low in power and reducing emissions significantly and still have a um, MGO backup um, and also transiting back and forth, um, you would do an MGO. But you could easily reach 80% um, emission reduction. And it's something that you can do with today's technology already. Now we can start with this today. Another point is shore connections in ports. Now we see large vessels also putting in large demands of shore connection. Um, and with mobile power barges, you could prevent having high investments in electrical shore connections uh, by putting mobile power barges there. I see I'm running out, out a little bit of time, so I'll go a bit quicker through the rest of the slides. Um, one of the things that we are seeing now in the Netherlands and Germany, for instance, is the Rhine project, where there's um, really the ambition to create a hydrogen fueled corridor with zero emission transport from port to door. And we see the first vessels are going to be operating there. And there's a lot of plans there to go big in 2025 with 30 vessels. We'll be supplying fuel cells to the mass. Um, hopefully they will be sailing early uh, uh, next year. Um, and as well, this will be a retrofit by the way. And um, they will have hydrogen storage containerized on board as will the Anthony from uh, Lenten Scheepvaart, who is also going to be sailing with compressed hydrogen containerized and which will be a new built vessel also due to operate somewhere in next year or early 2023. So that's um, what I had for you. Um, and I would be happy to take your questions. Yeah, thanks very much Joachim. Yeah, very good presentation on that. Uh, I, we got a few questions from the audience. So if I run through that. Yeah, sure. Yeah, all right. Um, the first question uh, asks for which fuels can be used as bunker for hydrogen fuel cells? So the, 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 the fuel cell itself, our technology requires pure hydrogen. 
However, indeed, that can be compressed hydrogen or liquid hydrogen. But what we also see is different liquid organic hydrogen carriers, so sort of hydrogen oils that are specifically designed to take as much hydrogen as possible. But it could well be from LNG or methanol or ammonia, but that requires quite complex um, reforming systems on board to take that hydrogen out. And if you want that zero emission, you want to keep the CO2, for instance, if you're methanol on board, um, so there's quite some systems around that, but it's possible to take the hydrogen also from other, um, yeah, like methanol uh, or carbon fuels. Yeah. And there's a lot of research going on there. All right. Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, the next question mentions about what kind of hazards can we expect to encounter in a hydrogen fuel cell installation? Um, I think the biggest hazard is um, explosion is the um, um, collection of hydrogen in your fuel cell system uh, where you don't want it. Yeah, so because your hydrogen is one of the, is the lightest molecule, it's, it's small, it's really hard to get everything leak tight. So that hydrogen could collect in some area um, and that could become a risk. However, the fuel cells, for instance, themselves are operating at a very low temperature. Um, so a fire, for instance, is not, one of the things that we see as a big risk. And even if you have a hydrogen fire, especially at our low pressure fuel cells, it will be quite local. While if you have a fuel fire, of course the fuel, if a fuel line would burst, you have of course the fuel spraying everywhere and it will also catch fire uh, everywhere. While if you have a hydrogen burst, it will just um, uh, burst at that point, go up. And if you would have an ignition there, it would be a, um, a short and narrow flame on that location. So, um, all right. But in the end, the biggest hazard is making sure that you don't have hydrogen in a explosive mixture um, on board or in your fuel cell system. All right. Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, the next question is: uh, Is it said that the fuel cells, the individual stack? have a lifetime of approximately three years after which it has to be replaced. This is short time for any investment. Yeah, so this is, uh, this is um, correct. If you're assuming um, 24,000 hours, nonstop operation, and uh, that's about three years. But you have to imagine that if you have a diesel generator running three years nonstop, you also have quite significant maintenance. Um, yeah. In our case, you would be able to replace the fuel cell stack yeah, with get the platinum out and uh, leave the rest of the system there. Um, however, if you look at the, um, the, the, the fuel cells, for instance, from the passenger car um, uh, market at the moment, uh, they would even have reduced lifetimes of maybe 20,000 to 10,000 hours, um, even lower, and then you would have to replace the whole system. So, um, and in addition, that stack replacement would be the first sort of maintenance that you require on the system. So you have three years of nothing, and then you would have a, a, a big replacement. However, if you're looking at larger system, you often have a distribution, and you probably you can extend that period to up to five years because you won't be using all of your fuel cell systems all of the time, 24 seven day. Yeah, yeah, all right, thanks. So the next question is, uh, fuel cell have a slow response on load fluctuations. Is that is this correct? Not reliable during maneuvering. Yeah, so what we see, of course, um, it's an electrochemical reactor. So as long as the fuel and the oxygen are there, you have instant reactions. So I would normally say that um, load changes of 10 to 20%, we can handle them instantly. That's not the problem. If you are looking at load changes of 50, 60%, so much higher, uh, you need maybe one or two seconds to get there. Um, but in the end, I think this is sort of similar to a diesel generator. Uh, it also doesn't like if you put 50% load on it at once. Uh, it also needs a little bit time to recover. It's similar to a, um, a fuel cell. Um, but for smaller load, ch load changes, I think it would be comparable to a battery. But that's specifically this low temperature PEM fuel cell technology. If indeed you're looking at other 
fuel cell technologies, this transient behavior can be very different. And at some point it can also become, if you don't have compressed hydrogen, for instance, as your feed in, but you have a reformer, that the speed of at which you can um, uh, make hydrogen free determines the overall dynamics of your system. All right, thanks for that. Uh, the next question mentions about the U.S. Department of Energy has set a 2030 target of $80 per kilowatt for heavy-duty fuel cell systems. What do you see as a target for marine fuel cell systems? Um, this is a really hard question. Um, the feedback that I get from most of my colleagues in the market, even for heavy-duty, they say we don't know how they arrived at this eighty kilo uh, dollars a kilowatt. It's a very steep number and it's a very high emission. Um, at the moment, for maritime fuel cell systems, uh, you have to think about a cost price of fifteen hundred to um, two and a half uh, uh, thousand euros per kilowatt. We think we can bring that down, um, and in two thousand thirty. Um, there will be down with, I would say, even 50%, maybe even a little bit more. But going towards 100 or 150 uh, uh, euros per kilowatt for a fuel cell system, that is really, really hard um, to get there. And that's also the problem a little bit with those figures. Are they pushing for just the stack price or for the whole system price? Um, and of course, the maritime industry um, is different in size and in specification and for instance the heavy duty. If you are provide if you're developing one system and you can do two million trucks, uh, that's a whole different scale than that we can do maybe um, a thousand vessels um, in a year, which would be already quite um, ambitious, I would guess. All right, yeah. Thanks for that. Uh, the next question. Uh... Uh, what are the contents of BMC? Ah, it's a BMC is bulk molding compound. There's um, uh, carbon in there, and there's graphite, and the other two I cannot mention. Okay, all right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, then I, thanks for that. Uh, the next question is: uh, What is the purity level of hydrogen and air expected for PEM to operate at its de designed efficiency? Yeah, so what we we designed fuel cell systems for 99.5 percent pure hydrogen um, in the end i think most of the pem fuel cells require a, a grade 5.5 so 99.9995 percent pure hydrogen in our case it's very specific um, we can alter the system a little bit what is the other percentage uh, in there if it's just nitrogen it's not really a problem. We just purge a little bit more, bleed a little bit more. But if it's coming from ammonia, for instance, and it would be ammonia, then you have a problem because that's toxic to the fuel cells. And then even the, the smallest traces of ammonia can be um, decremental for the fuel cells. And that's the same in the end for air. Uh, we do thorough um, cleaning already, humidification, so we can have salt air. That's not a problem. That is also what we've seen in the past, our power plants have all been in ports, yeah, right at sea. Um, so we can deal with that, but if there's some kind of chemicals in there, um, then you might have an issue, but I don't expect too much of that to happen. Okay, all right, thanks for that. Uh, the next question is, I assume your FCs are finding application in military vessels. So fuel cells are finding application in military vessels. What are the types of these military vessels besides submarines? Yeah, I think the military seems to be still a little bit conservative, I think. So they are a little bit on the back bench, but they would be starting with auxiliary vessels, uh, I would assume, just to build up the experience, the, the value chains, also the supply chain of hydrogen, for instance. Um, so okay. yeah, that would be um, feasible for us. But in the end, fuel cells could replace any diesel generator. Yeah, all right. So while you're mentioning about that, so can an existing ship can be with a diesel generator? Can we do a conversion for that with the fuel cell technology? So if the, if so, what is the kind of uh, um, arrangements to be looked into? 
Yeah. Now, so it's easier if you already have a um, electric propulsion drive line, and yeah? then you would be able to say, okay, I replace the diesel engines, um, maybe change a little bit of the power conversion, or add something to feed the grid, and you can um, uh, put in fuel cells quite easily. Of course, the hydrogen storage is mostly the uh, limiting factor. Where can uh, the vessels uh, that are sailing now? have not been designed for either compressed hydrogen storage or liquid hydrogen. And so you would have to maybe uh, also, um, you will lose maybe some cargo space or passenger space to make new um, storage compartments. Okay. Um, and yeah, you will have to replace some of the piping. If you go from a diesel direct driven um, ship, uh, you also have to, replace the whole propulsion drivetrain because you have to go to electric propulsion. And right. then it's very important to look at the operational profile, find out as much as you can to find the optimum solution of that hybrid battery fuel cell drivetrain to make a really zero emission. Because maybe you can work with a smaller fuel cell and with a lar larger battery pack because you have maybe some high peak powers. But if you're on a high um, average power, it would be better to install a bigger fuel cell system and maybe a small battery pack. This is something that is probably specific to to that specific case, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, which makes it a little bit more complicated. All right, yeah. Thanks for that. Um, okay, so the ne next question is, if one of one or a few fuel stack, a fuel cell stacks malfunction, how will the system react? Um, depends, of course, a little bit on the size of the system, but in general, if you have a malfunction of the system, the system will just shut down. It will tell you this, uh, this stack has a problem and it will just shut down. Um, sometimes it's just water yeah, and uh, um, you have to get a little bit familiar with it and you can start it up again and then the problem is gone. That is a possibility. Um, or indeed you have uh, really a problem with the stack and then you have to replace it. Okay, all right, thanks for that. Uh, any special considerations or qualification requirements for naval vessels? Um, yeah, I think in, in, in general for uh, patrolling, um, it could well be a commercial solution. Of course, the combat requirements and then the vibration shocks loads that you um, um, uh, might, or that you have to comply to, can require um, uh, different applications. I would say uh, we would normally work together with, um, uh, and we work with commercial available industrial equipment um, and with system integrators at a certain level. So in this case, we would also work together with a company and really say, okay, what is um, required and how can we maybe, um, make the stack library or the, 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 the containment more rigidized that you can handle those <coughs> shocks. Okay, all right. Thanks, uh, thanks very much. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, but yeah. I would be happy with the, the, they can contact me if they want. I would be happy <laughs> to get into the discussion and see what we can do. Yeah, 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 that's true. <laughs> yeah. Next question is, uh, moving towards 2050 target, when do you think fuel cell technology would be scalable enough? Um, I think we're scalable already. I think the question is not so much at the moment on um, technical feasibility um, uh, of the fuel cell systems. Of course, there's room for improvement. But, but what we have today, and which not only we have, but also our competitors, we can start with this today. Um, and we need the market and the funding to also um, scale up our factories, of course. Um, but I think the question is much more commercial at the moment yeah, with all the alternatives which are still out there. And um, that makes it much harder to um, scale up because uh, I know the marine industry is also looking at combusting ammonia, combusting methanol, um, CO2 capture. And I think that is predominantly slowing down the acceptance of fuel cells because it involves just a bit more. We're not just swapping one fuel for another, uh, you, or yeah. just uh, and and you can combust another liquid type carbon fuel. And uh, we're replacing, of course, the fuel, um, everything around that, which makes it more complex. 
And I can imagine that if you're a ship owner, you think, okay, I have a diesel direct driven ship and I can just put in methanol and I'm okay. Um, yeah. That you try to go for that solution. However, the question is, if that's zero enough eh, and that if we will meet our targets, which is, yeah, I think is um, not that evidently at the moment. Yeah. Okay, thanks for that. I think the continuation of that question also, I think you already answered that. that how does uh, fuel cells compare with other carbon neutral power energy sources in terms of cost and availability? Yeah, maybe you can elaborate on yeah. that. Well, I think this is this is not an easy answer to 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 uh, question to answer, because there's a lot of developments now going on, and of course, if you look at a, a, a normal diesel genset now, and you have a much lower cost, maybe a fifth of the cost of a fuel cell, maybe even more. Um, however, if you go to stage five, eh, um, that cost is only two and a half because the engine becomes maybe one and a half to two times more expensive. If you want that engine then to become really zero emission, then you have to add up the after treatment. And then if you, it's really what are you comparing? Uh, methanol engine, probably the engine will be much cheaper. But if you're saying, okay, I want to be zero emission, and you need to do carbon storage on board. And you need additional pure water to get um, hydrogen, for instance, again, out of the air, uh, combusting the hydrogen. So it's really complex to say, okay, what are you comparing? All right, yeah. Thanks for that. Uh, the next question, when reducing hydrogen pressure from 500 to 5 bar, is adiabatic shock within the pipe work and valves a danger as it is with high pressure air? Um, I'm not so familiar with that. I, what I see is that we do, um, or what we, what we see is that we decrease the pressure very close to the um, storage. So you have 500 bar in the storage, but maybe um, uh, one meter from there, you already have the pressure reduction back to maybe 10 bars and then another one to five bars, something like that. So it's quite local to the, um, uh, the storage. So, uh -huh. but, um, yeah, I'm not really sure if that's the right answer. I also don't know the answer um, just yet. Because often this is supplied by the storage companies um, and they sell their systems with the availability to take all the hydrogen out. So, okay, yeah. okay, And it's a right. gradual um, decrease, I would say. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, okay. Thanks for that. Thanks very much. Uh, next question, one more question is there. From okay, Frederick L.E.B. Please, how is it, how is possible to transport hydrogen gas in the present oil and gas pipelines? Well, uh, what I've seen, I think there's quite some studies from um, Gasuni in the Netherlands, TNO, and I think they did something in the UK as well, um, is that the current gas lines are already um, feasible of transporting um, hydrogen. And if not, they can be coated um, from the inside which um, is a, quite a small uh, um, in, in investment in the piping to produce, to transport hydrogen instead of natural gas. Um, and then you need to replace, um, I think some valves, ceilings, uh, uh, maybe on pumps uh, on, the, on the substations in this gas network, because they might not be directly uh, feasible for hydrogen. But it seems to be that it's not that difficult and also not that expensive in the scale of things to um, repurpose our existing gas networks. All right, okay. okay. At least in the Netherlands and in the UK. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, all right, so I think uh, that ends the last question. Uh, yeah, so yeah, Jokshom, actually, Jokshom, thanks very much for this uh, very informative and enlightening presentation. Fantastic, actually, you, you cleared so many questions from the audience and uh, you know uh, it's a new technology for the marine side but uh, you are clarified uh, quite a lot of uh, questions from that side thanks very much and uh, on behalf of our institute i like to thank you for this very informative and enlightening presentation and um, thanks for inviting uh, thanks for accepting our invite
to address our members. We are very delighted for that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the invitation. <laughs> Welcome, all right. And uh, thanks to all the delegates for joining this live stream and for your participation and for your inputs. Thanks very much. And wish you a pleasant day ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.